Okay, this is the pre-lecture, uh, lecture for Friday, September 7th, and in this section we're going to finish up our general chemistry review uh, dealing with a couple of side issues of looking at structures of what will become our organic molecules, as well as looking at the issue of polarity and uh, intermolecular forces, which were which are the topics that came after drawing Lewis dot structures, talking about Vesper theory, and then we moved into polarity and intermolecular forces back in general chemistry. So the first thing that uh, in those sections of your textbook that they talk about was the idea of Lewis dot structures and free rotation or not so free rotation around single bonds. If you have a molecule, and let's take a very simple molecule that has a bond that we can rotate around. So let's put two carbon atoms together and surround it with hydrogens. We know that this Lewis dot structure isn't the three-dimensional structure of the molecule. The three-dimensional structure of the molecule would be when we realize that these two carbons are sp3 hybridized and tetrahedral, and then we would have a structure that would look something maybe like this, where I have a carbon, the carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds are in the plane, I might have a hydrogen atom pointing towards me and a hydrogen atom pointing away from me. The bold and dashed wedges here represent a bond that is in front of the screen, and the dashed line represents something that is behind the screen. So these bold and dashed wedges are ways that we can represent a tetrahedral representation of an atom. And in a tetrahedral representation, we always have two bonds that are in the plane, one bond that's towards you, and one bond that's away from you. And so if you can imagine the structure of a tetrahedron, that's how we represent it. If I went to the other carbon, I might have a structure. I might do this, where I would have, again, the same, the same uh, tetrahedral representation where the carbon-carbon and this carbon-hydrogen bond are in the uh, same plane, or in the plane of the screen, and then this hy hydrogen is pointing towards you, and that hydrogen is pointing away from you. But this is the true three-dimensional structure. The Lewis dot, st uh, Lewis dot structure is not a three-dimensional structure. You've got to take that through Vesper theory to get your three-dimensional structure. Now. In terms of what's called free rotation around a carbon-carbon bond, we will get into much more detail about this later. But basically, I can rotate around this carbon-carbon bond and rotate these hydrogen atoms, or this CH3 group, so that this hydrogen could rotate behind the plane of the board, this hydrogen could come in front, or could come into the plane, and then this hydrogen could go that way. And so I have this sort of free rotation around the around the carbon-carbon bond. It's not free, but at room temperature, there's more than enough thermal energy to overcome this. And we'll talk about the details of this. This is actually the difference between what's called an eclipsed and, st and staggered conformations later on. But the idea here is that if you have single bonds, you can rotate to form um, different three-dimensional structures. And the point that they're making in the textbook is that if I had a structure where I had a CH3 group attached to this carbon with two hydrogens here, and then another carbon with a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and another CH3 group, this Lewis dot structure would be exactly the same as this Lewis dot structure, which would be exactly the same as 
that Lewis dot structure, which would be exactly the same as this one. All four of these structures are the same molecule. If you were to take this Lewis dot structure and sort of imagine it in this three-dimensional structure, you might have a CH3 group. And remember, a CH3 group is nothing more than a carbon, a tetrahedral carbon that has three hydrogens attached to it. That's our CH3 group. You can imagine that maybe you have the CH3 group back here. Or in, and then you could maybe rotate the CH3 group up here or down here. That's kind of, but not exactly, what these four represent. These four represent different, the same Lewis dot structure, but in just slightly different formats. But all four of these structures are exactly the same. And when we look at Lewis dot structures, what we have to do is we have to realize that there are four carbon atoms here attached in a line, whether that line goes this way or one, two, three, four carbons that way, or one, two, three, four carbons that way. All three of these are the same structure because there's a CH3 attached to a CH2, attached to a CH2, attached to a CH3. The same thing's true here. CH3 attached to CH2, attached to CH2, attached to CH3. And so all four of these represent the same structure. Okay. It's, it's as if I wrote water this way. You learned early on in general chemistry that that's a valid Lewis dot structure for water. That's a valid Lewis dot structure for water, etc. The oxygen's attached to two hydrogens with two lone pairs. It doesn't matter how I order them or in what direction because this is not a three-dimensional representation. This structure right here is a three-dimensional representation. Okay, so the point that the book's making is that when you have single bonds, there are, in essence, different three-dimensional structures that you get by rotating around the carbon-carbon bond, but they all represent the same molecule or the same structure and the same structure chemically. Now that's not true when you go to double bonds because if you were to take, as an example, these two molecules, These two molecules would actually have slightly different physical properties because they actually don't have that quote unquote free rotation around the carbon carbon bond. And so when you have a carbon carbon double bond, the positions of the four groups that are attached to the carbon carbon double bond are not interchangeable. So I cannot interchange this into this by rotation. That's not allowed. And the reason it's not allowed is we have to go back to our hybridization discussion of Wednesday. If I was to draw out an orbital picture of this molecule, I would have my sigma bond, and I would have my pi bond, and I would have the hydrogen maybe pointing towards me and the chlorine away, the other hydrogen pointing away from me in the chlorine like this. So here's my pi bond and then here's my sigma bond that holds the carbon-carbon bond together. Now, because of the pi bond, I cannot freely rotate. This pi bond sticks the molecule into this, into this three-dimensional structure. The only way I could rotate around this carbon and maybe put the chlorine in the back would be to break the pi bond. So if I applied enough energy, and it'd have to be quite a bit of energy, to break the pi bond, then I would, in essence, have this structure. with each of the p orbitals having one electron, and now I would just simply have a single bond that I could freely rotate around
and then I could convert this structure up into this one. But the problem here is that that energy required is on the order of hundreds of kilojoules per mole. And that energy is not available at room temperature. It's not available to the molecule at room temperature. And so there is no quote unquote free rotation because that bond just doesn't spontaneously break. And so in the case of the single bond at room temperature, there's plenty enough energy to cause this carbon-carbon bond to rotate. That's why we call it quote-unquote free rotation. But for a double bond, it would require considerably more energy to break it, to rotate it. So we consider then these two molecules to be different structures. And they, also, they do have different physical properties. And uh, later on, I'll show you an example where this molecule is polar and this molecule this molecule is not polar, the one on the left, the one on the right turns out to be a polar molecule, and so they have different physical properties. Okay, So that's what that point, uh, the first section that the book is for this reading uh, talks about. Now this gets us into the idea of isomers and what different types of isomers. Basically when you talk about isomers, these are going to be molecules that have, in essence, the same molecular formula. But they're going to have different structures. And the question is, what do we mean by different structures? So the book, first of all, talks about, defines two types. The first is constitutional isomers, which I don't like the term constitutional in this context. I call it, I call these structural isomers. That's the older term. So constitutional isomers and, or structural isomers, they do have the same molecular formula. But now I'm going to define structure a little bit differently and say that the atoms are attached differently. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's an example. Here's, here's a couple of examples of constitutional or structural isomers. Let's say I have the molecular formula C2H6O. How many different ways can I put these atoms together to form molecules that have different attachments of the atoms? Well, I could take three of the hydrogens attached to the carbon, attach that carbon to another carbon, put two hydrogens on it, and then attach the OH group. This is called ethanol. And some of you may have had this as an unknown in Organic Lab. Some of you, if you're above 21 or 21 and above, may indulge in a little ethyl alcohol. But the idea is that we've got carbon attached to carbon attached to O attached to H. I could actually write another isomer of that molecular formula by attaching two CH3 groups to the oxygen. And in this case, this would be called dimethyl ether. And it has totally different physical properties than ethanol. And so constitutional or structural isomers means same molecular formula, but the atoms are attached differently. Next Monday, we'll talk about functional groups, and we'll find out that ethanol is an alcohol functional group and that this is an ether functional group because it's got an oxygen with two carbons versus an oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon attached to it. Okay, so there's lots of examples of constitutional isomers where atoms are attached differently. There is also the example that I just showed you on the previous slide that, that is an example of a stereoisomer. We're going to encounter several different types of stereoisomers during the course of the semester. But the example that I showed you earlier was 
if we had this molecule with that we could not convert so we could not convert the left molecule into the right molecule but we had these two molecules now each one of these molecules contains two carbons two hydrogens and two chlorines so these two molecules have the same molecular formula but they actually have the same connectivity of the atoms and so we have a carbon attached to a hydrogen chlorine this carbon double bonded to another carbon that's attached to a chlorine and a hydrogen over here we have the same thing we got a carbon attached to hydrogen and chlorine double bonded to a carbon that's attached to a hydrogen and a chlorine so stereoisomers have the same molecular formula and they have the same attachment of the atoms so what's different about them well the difference is and I'll have to bring that definition down here the difference is that they have different three-dimensional structures in this molecule if we look at this side of the double bond and remember these are not interconvertible so it's not like I can make this into this if I look on this side of the double bond I've got a hydrogen and a chlorine if I look over here on this side of the double bond I've got two hydrogens and so these two these two structures have different three-dimensional shapes or different three-dimensional structures and so stereoisomers have the same molecular formula the same attachment of atoms which basically what do these two mean these two mean that this is the same they are the same structural isomer but they have different three-dimensional structures or three-dimensional shapes if you want to use that term okay. so stereoisomers are the same structural isomer but have different shapes or different three-dimensional structures this example right here in the book talks about a couple of terms to describe these specific ones when you have groups that are attached differently to carbon to carbon double bonds those are what are called cis trans isomers I think the book uses the term geometric isomers but I like cis trans isomers and it's going to be a little bit of a, some time before we uh, define cis and trans in this context but basically this would be called the trans isomer of this molecule and this would be called the cis isomer of that molecule and the reason that I would call it the trans isomer trans means across in organic chemistry terms and so these two chlorine atoms are across from each other in the double bond they're on opposite sides is the way we'll define trans later on they're on opposite sides whereas and I, the same thing would be true for the hydrogen I could say this hydrogen and this hydrogen are on opposite sides in the cis cis means the same side and so in this case the two chlorines are on the same side of the double bond or we could look at it and say the two hydrogens are on the same side of the double bond so cis trans isomers are a type of stereoisomer and we'll come back to this in another week or so when we talk about cyclic alkanes because we'll, they have a specific cis and trans um, stereoisomers and I'm going to point out one other thing here that cis and trans isomers are not cannot be interconverted without the application of some pretty serious energy we can't turn cis into trans unless I break the pi bond first like I saw on the previous slide okay so that's the difference between our not our free rotation where we can have different Lewis dot structures that are identical to each other if they involve double bonds there's going to be no free rotation and so we're going to end up with 
different structures which we can further define as different cis-trans isomers or different stereoisomers. Okay, and we'll talk about the constitutional isomers and structural isomers as we talk about functional groups next week on Monday. So the next sort of review of general chemistry that we need to look at is the issue of polarity and whether a molecule is polar or not polar. And one of the key, the absolute key is that the electron is to look at the electronegativity of bonds because that's how we're going to determine whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. So remember, electronegativity is a measure of an, is of an atom's ability to attract electrons to itself in a chemical bond. The highest is fluorine, and everything on the periodic table moves towards fluorine. So as I'm going from carbon to nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine, I'm increasing electronegativity as I'm going fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, electronegativity increases towards the fluorine as well. So that's what we're going to do, we're going to use to determine, at least in the first step, of whether a molecule is polar. When you bond two atoms together, what happens is that difference in electronegativity creates what's called a bond dipole moment. So this is the slide I use for general chemistry. It tells you exactly what the bond dipole is. And mu, it's the product of the charges and the distance between the charges. It's sort of a coulombic um, term. But if I took an H and a Cl, and I know that chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, what would happen is the chlorine would be attracting some electron density it would be attracting some electron density towards itself and away from the hydrogen. Now, how do we represent a bond dipole moment? There's two ways. We can either use an arrow to indicate the movement of that electron density. And the way that we do that is we use this arrow, and I like to put this plus charge here to indicate the atom that's losing the electronegativity or losing electron density, and the arrow is showing the movement of electron density towards the more electronegative element. It's not a curved arrow, but it's still showing the electron movement or electron density movement, just like the curved arrow showed the movement of a pair of electrons. We can also go back and use our delta terms because in the end, the chlorine will be delta minus. It will have gained some negative charge. This is still a shared bond. It's not a perfectly shared bond, but this is a polar covalent bond. The chlorine will have picked up some electronegativity at the expense of the hydrogen. Therefore, it will have some negative charge or delta minus, and the hydrogen will have some positive charge or delta plus. So that's how we represent the bond dipole moments is either using the delta plus, delta minus, or most likely we use the arrow formalism. So when you take a molecule, and here's an example of that HCl molecule with a delta plus towards the hydrogen and a delta minus towards the chlorine, you know that a molecule is polar because if you place it inside of a of inside of two electrodes with no electric field being passed to two of them, they might orient themselves so that the delta plus side of one molecule might be oriented towards the delta minus of another, but they certainly aren't attracted to the plates. But as soon as you turn the plates on, now all of a sudden there's an order here, and you've got the delta minus side of the molecule, the delta minus side attracted to the positive plate, and then the delta plus is attracted to the delta minus of another molecule. The delta plus over here is attracted to the delta minus. And then the delta plus sides of the molecule are attracted to the negative plate. And so this is actually how we measure the polarity of molecules. And if you're reading for next week the lab experiment that we're going to do on the uh, recrystallization solvents, the the dipole moment 
is actually listed in one of the tables, and this is how people put a quantitative term to that and measure it. When we do molecular bond, or molecular moments or molecular dipole moments, we're going to basically take those individual di bond dipoles and we're going to add them up, treating them as if they were vectors. So in other words, we're going to have arrows. We're going to add them up as if they were a vector sum. And then that's going to give us what's called the molecular dipole moment. But practically, the most important thing is that if we are going to classify a molecule to be polar, it has to have these two things. And if it doesn't have either of these two things, it's not polar. And so first thing is it has to have a polar covalent bond. If you don't have a polar covalent bond, you'll never have a molecular dipole moment, period. What do I mean by a polar covalent bond? That means that we have to have two atoms attached together of different electronegativity. And really, on the periodic table, there are very few that very few atoms that have exactly the same electronegativity. So a polar covalent bond just means you have atoms of two different polarities or di two different electronegativities. It basically means that you have two different elements attached to each other. And I'll modify that a little bit as we go along. But even if you have a polar covalent bond, you may not be a polar molecule if you don't have the second criteria, which is you have to have a non-zero molecular dipole moment. So what is that, and how do we come up with that? Well, here's sort of the nuts and bolts way of looking at this. Here's water. We know that water is a polar molecule, but how do I get that? Well, I look at the oxygen-hydrogen bond, and I find that each one of those is a polar covalent bond. And if I use my arrow formalism, I would draw the electronegativity or the electron density moving towards the oxygen. Right, the oxygen's delta minus, and then these two hydrogens, they're delta plus in each one of those polar covalent bonds. To determine if I have a, an overall molecular dipole moment, these bond dipoles cannot, they cannot cancel each other out. And so if I was drawing the molecular dipole moment, what I would do is I would add these two vectors together. And the way you add vectors is we start at sort of the center of the molecule. We draw one of the dipoles off in its direction and its length, the length being how much of a difference there is in polarity, or I'm sorry, in electronegativity between the, two element, between the two elements. And then where we stop with this arrow, we get the next one. We draw, if there was a third arrow, we'd start here and go off in that direction. And then at the end, we go where we started from to where we ended up, and that then is my overall molecular dipole. And what I'm more concerned about is the fact that these two arrows don't cancel each other out. So if we looked at BF3, here's a molecule that has three polar covalent bonds. Fluorine is the most electronegative element, so it's clearly delta minus. The boron is delta plus, but notice that when I draw my three, di three bond dipoles here, they cancel each other out. So that if I started at boron and drew the blue bond dipole, then went with the pink one, and then went with the red one, I end up exactly where I started from, which means there's no overall molecular dipole moment. So these three cancel each other out. And basically, what we have to realize is this. Before you can tell a molecule is polar or nonpolar, the first thing you need to do is get a valid Lewis dot structure. Then secondly, you need to convert that Lewis dot structure into a valid Vesper geometry. And then you can determine the bond dipoles and see if they cancel each other out. And if they do, it's nonpolar. If they don't, then it's a polar molecule, provided you have polar covalent bonds in your molecule. So that's why the Lewis dot structure converted to Vesper theory is so important. In general, if you have a symmetrical structure, and this molecule would be symmetrical because I could pass 
sort of a plane right down the center of this BF bond and the left and right sides would be the same. If you have a symmetrical structure where all the atoms that are attached are the same, they will cancel each other out. And that's the case for the BF3. So here's water again. We know that water had a bond dipole this way, a bond dipole that way, and an overall net dipole. These two did not cancel each other out. And then this, these types of pictures you'll see in your textbook, these are sort of um, electron distribution maps, or actually they're charge distribution. Red is always where the delta minus charge in the molecule is. And then blue is always where the delta plus charge is in the molecule. So really, being a polar molecule means this, that you have an overall molecular dipole moment. But what does that really mean? What it really means is that in the overall distribution of charge around the molecule, there is a difference. There is a point where you have more electron charge and less electron charge. If the if the um, charge distribution around the molecule is identically the same, and in these types of diagrams that means they all would be the same color, that molecule is not polar. A polar molecule needs to have a shape where one side is delta minus and that became delta minus at the expense of another side becoming delta plus. If all of it's delta minus, or if it's all of it's delta plus, and the same delta minus and the same delta plus charge, you're not polar. You don't have a polar molecule, which means all of your bond dipoles will cancel out. Here's ammonia, NH3. right? So drawing the Lewis dot structure of ammonia, I would have this with the lone pair. Now, no, lone pairs don't actually come into play when we're determining polarity of the molecule. So if I wrote ammonia like this, what would I do? I would look at this ammonia and I would say it's best for electron pair geometry around the nitrogen is tetrahedral. So I'd have some lone pair here that I'm not going to worry about but I would have a tetrahedral geometry. So I'd have a hydrogen and maybe the hydrogen lone pair in the plane of the screen. There's a hydrogen pointing towards me. There's a hydrogen pointing away from me. Now when I draw my bond dipoles, they would go like this. They're all pointed in the same direction, so the sum of that would be a bond dipole, an overall dipole moment that looks like that. The head of the arrow is where the delta minus charge overall in the molecule is. Where the arrows start, that's where the delta plus charge is. So you can see in this structure, here's your tetrahedral representation of ammonia. Its lone pair would be up here. And then here's the, char here's the electron charge distribution around the molecule where you can see that the delta minus is exactly where the head of the arrow is and the delta plus charge is down here where all the hydrogens are. So ammonia is a polar molecule because it has a polar covalent bond, NH, and it also has a molecular dipole moment. HBr, really simple one. The H is, in this case, delta plus. The Br is delta minus the molecular or the bond dipole is the molecular dipole. The bromine is where all the delta minus charge is in the molecule and the hydrogen end is where all the delta plus charge is as shown by the red and the blue in this diagram. When you get the tetrahedral structures it becomes a little bit tricky because if you were really to take CH2F2 I would write this Lewis dot structure like that. And another thing I like to do when I'm teaching general chemistry is to sort of trick students because I'll, I'll write these two Lewis dot structures. And I'll say, 
is CH2F2 polar or not? And I'll write this Lewis dot structure, and people will say, yes, it is, because it's not symmetrical. And then I'll write this one, and they'll say, well, no, it isn't, because the carbon-fluorine dipoles cancel each other out, and so do the CH. But the problem is, remember, these are Lewis dot structures. These have to be converted to a tetrahedral structure. And so the real structure of CF2 doesn't, it's, it's, these two are the same. I'd have a carbon attached to a fluorine, attached to another fluorine, and those two are in the plane of the screen. Then I'd have a hydrogen pointing towards me and a hydrogen pointing away from me. Now, if these were square, what are called square planar, and all these bonds were in the plane of the, in the plane of the board or in the plane of the screen, then this would be a nonpolar form, and that would be a polar form. But that's not that's not the way it works. So when you look at the tetrahedral structure, if I'm drawing, I would draw my dipole moments in this direction, and then my CH. Wait, well, those are completely backwards. So I should take it, erase it. They go in this direction, right? There's my individual bond dipoles there. Here's my bond dipole there. They're all kind. Of, they're all pointing in the same direction, in the tetrahedron, which is right there. And you can see that down here. Down here, you can see huge delta minus charge very strong delta plus charge on that side of CH2F2. Okay. The only way a tetrahedral structure will be nonpolar is if all four atoms are exactly the same. And if all four atoms are exactly the same, then that will be a nonpolar molecule. So if three of the atoms are the same but one's different, that molecule will not be nonpolar. It will have some polarity to it. So again, that gets back to the idea of it's sometimes easier to tell when you're not polar, and then if you're not polar, then you are polar. So if you have a symmetrical molecule in any of the geometries, linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, even trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral, any symmetrical structure is going to be nonpolar. So that means if I had SF6, SF6 would have an octahedral geometry when I wrote it out for its Vesper theory. And so this being octahedral, would have then all of these bond dipoles would cancel each other out. So this would be a nonpolar molecule. Okay. Um, again, if, if I took one of these fluorines away and I put a lone pair in, then the molecule would be polar. So any symmetrical structure in any of those geometries is not, is going to generate a nonpolar molecule. Okay. And we'll we'll do some more examples in class where I'll give you a couple of structures and then you can tell me if they're polar or nonpolar after drawing the appropriate Lewis dot structure, converting that to Vesper theory, and then looking at the bond dipoles and the molecular dipoles. Why do we do polarity to get to intermolecular forces? So Intermolecular forces are typically the beginning of general chemistry second semester. And there's two types of forces that are in a molecule, the bond energies that hold the atoms together. If you want to break two atoms apart, it's going to cost you hundreds of kilojoules per mole. Then there's the forces that hold molecules together. In other words, holds molecule A with molecule B. These are all electrostatic forces. In other words, by electrostatic or coulombic attraction, I mean that plus is attracted to minus and delta plus is attracted to delta minus. So intermolecular forces then are the forces that are between these molecules. 
and intermolecular forces cause things to become solids or liquids or the lack of really critical intermolecular forces makes things liquids or the reason why things are or I'm sorry liquids are, are gases and if it's a solid that means there's some pretty significant intermolecular forces if it's a liquid and the molecules can slide past each other then those have a little bit less intermolecular force and then if they're gases and they have virtually no attractive force to each other then those intermolecular forces are very 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 weak but intermolecular forces are are just a few kilojoules per mole as opposed to hundreds that it takes to break carbon to break um, bonds so as you remember hopefully from general chemistry there's four different types of intermolecular forces there are what are called induced dipole induced dipole or London dispersion forces um, these were also in the older literature called van der Waals forces but I think that's fallen out of favor so we have dispersion forces those are going to occur between two nonpolar molecules dipole dipole forces occur between two mol between two polar molecules ion dipole forces that we get when we dissolve for instance a cation or an anion into water into a polar solvent occur between an ion and a polar molecule and then hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole dipole force that occurs between an oxygen a nitrogen and a fluorine that have a hydrogen attached to them and so those are actually much stronger forces than just your run-of-the-mill dipole dipole forces intermolecular forces how do we know they exist how do we compare them intermolecular forces show up when we try and measure melting points or boiling points if I have two solids and one melts at a significantly higher temperature it means it has it usually means and I'll explain the caveat there in a moment it usually means that those um, molecules have strong intermolecular forces if they have a low boiling point then they have weaker intermolecular forces same things true for liquids if you have a low boiling point you have weaker intermolecular forces if you have a very high boiling point you've got much stronger intermolecular forces okay. so the induced dipole induced dipole or what are called dispersion forces occur between two nonpolar molecules what happens when two nonpolar molecules come together is this first remember in your nonpolar molecule you have the same charge throughout the surface of the molecule there's no delta plus part there's no delta minus part it's either all delta plus or all delta minus and so when you bring those two molecules together they don't have a particular attraction because there's no part that's opposite for the other they either all have the same charge either all have the same delta minus or delta plus charge there's no part of the molecule that can attract to the other part and in this and in this remember opposites do completely attract so delta plus always attracted to delta minus but when you bring two molecules that are nonpolar together for a split second or for an instant the molecule can basically cause an unequal distribution of charge so that for a brief moment it generates part of the molecule that's delta plus and part of it that's delta minus and so when these two molecules come close together they generate these instantaneous sort of dipoles but they're influenced by these two nonpolar molecules coming together hence the name induced dipole induced dipole so they induce a dipole in one another that is very fleeting and therefore this delta plus and this delta minus charge are very weak and so overall this is an incredibly weak intermolecular force but it is an intermolecular force nonetheless so it's an instantaneous induced dipole in the molecule that then causes the opposite charges to attract to each other dipole dipole forces occur when two polar molecules come together because those two molecules have permanent 
dipole moments. So the examples that are shown here that are a little bit difficult sometimes to see in the box is if I brought two CH3Cl molecules together. These are polar molecules because the chlorine's delta minus and then the hydrogen parts are delta plus. Right? This whole part's delta plus and the chlorine's delta minus. Well, that's a polar molecule and so it has an in it has a permanent dipole moment in it. Well, if it has a permanent dipole moment, that means that the delta minus end of the molecule would be attracted to the delta plus end, but these are not just dipoles that instantly exist. They're dipoles that are permanent, and so this is a much stronger force. When you have an ion dipole force, you have one of those two species that has a positive or a negative charge. And it's not just a delta plus or delta minus charge, it's a full-blown plus one, plus two. So you can think about taking sodium and dissolving it in water. You would have the water then, even if it had a delta minus and a delta plus charge, that positive charge on that, new, on that ion would be tr attracted to the delta minus of the solvent. And again, this is a stronger force because this, while this is just a delta minus charge from the polar nature of the molecule, this is a fully blown positive one charge. And in Coulombic attraction, you're, the strength of the attraction is proportional to the charges. So the bigger the charge, the bigger the attraction. Same thing would be true if I had a delta positive part of a solvent that would be attracted to the full blown negative one charge of an iodide ion. And these are the types of forces that we see when we dissolve ionic solids into water. We have our ionic solid that's made up of positive and negative cations and anions. The water molecule, which has this Mickey Mouse shape, has delta minus part and delta plus parts. And so what happens is, is that the delta minus ends up attracted to the positive charge of the cation and the delta positive charge of the water molecule ends up attracted to the minus of the anion. And so that's how solvated ions look like in solution. Okay, now going back to dipole-dipole forces, there is a particularly strong type of dipole-dipole force that's called hydrogen bonding. And so hydrogen bonding is going to occur when I take a hydrogen atom and I attach it to one of the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table, oxygen or nitrogen or fluorine. If I attach a hydrogen to that electronegative element, I'm going to get a very strong delta plus, delta minus separation here of electron density. And so what happens is, is the hydrogen is as delta plus as it's going to get. The oxygen here is as delta minus as it's going to get. And so when two water molecules come together, the delta plus hydrogen of one water is attracted to the delta minus of the oxygen. And the delta plus of the hydrogen is attracted to another delta minus of an oxygen of the water. And so because these three elements are very electronegative, they suck as much electron density out of the proton as they can. And so we end up with a very, very polar bond that will cause these very strong dipole-dipole intera interactions. And you talked about hydrogen bonding in general chemistry, the, the idea that a water molecule forms hydrogen bonds to itself from the hydrogen and the oxygen. So here's kind of a representation of water molecules solvating or actually being attracted to each other. Um, here's a little bit more interesting picture of how water molecules form those intermolecular hydrogen bonds. When you have water freezing, it forms a hexagonal structure where the um, intermolecular force forces are very, very regular, so you get a hexagonal um, structure, and that's what gives you the hexagonal structure that corresponds to things like snowflakes. And here again, you can see that sort of three-dimensional um, 
sort of tetrahedral structure that that you can see for the ice. Um, that's the reason why ice um, expands, water expands when it freezes is because in this structure when you form all of these intermolecular um, hydrogen bonds, they form a regular structure which has a lot more empty space in it than when the water was a liquid, so it's density um, decreases because there's less mass for per volume because the volume goes up and so that's why when you freeze something in a glass container when you freeze a full glass container full of water it's probably not going to remain in one piece and that's why ice again has a lower density than that of water than of liquid water you also get into hydrogen bonding when you talk about biochemistry and things like proteins. In a protein, you've got a C double bonded to an O with a nitrogen and a hydrogen on it. You can have these strands of proteins form hydrogen bonds where the C double bond O of one may be hydrogen bonded to the NH of another molecule so that you can have these intermolecular hydrogen bonds form between the strands of proteins. Um, in this case, you form those beta sheet structures that make up things like fingernails and, and all sorts of those types of proteins. And you can also have alpha helices form, again, because of the strength of those hydrogen bonds. And ultimately, what holds DNA together in its double strand is the hydrogen bond between the base pairs, the ATCG base pairs, and so you've talked extensively in general chemistry and probably even in general biology about the nature of the hydrogen bond. So when we look at intermolecular forces then, the strongest intermolecular force would be an ion dipole. Then it would be hydrogen bonding. Then it would be dipole-dipole between two molecules that can hydrogen bond but are polar. Then you can have things like the induced uh, ion-induced dipole, and ultimately down here at the bottom, dispersion forces are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. Okay, and so that's probably right there a week's worth of general chemistry, sort of condensed, and hopefully you remember um, about the intermolecular forces. But to get to intermolecular forces, we need a valid Lewis dot structure converted to Vesper geometries, is the molecule polar or not, and then we look at the intermolecular forces that occur between those molecules. And if you like flow charts, here's a flow chart as to figure out what kinds of intermolecular forces that you have. Okay, the last topic. So what do we do with intermolecular forces? Well, we use them to explain things like solubilities of molecules. Probably every fifth grader in the country, if you ask them about things like solubility, they may not know that term, but pretty much every science student in middle school knows like dissolves like. Well, like what? What is the like in like dissolves like? The like refers to basically what types of intermolecular forces that two molecules undergo. That's ultimately what's going to decide whether two, whether two types of molecules are soluble in each other, which is what we sometimes call miscible, or whether they will not dissolve. Sometimes we think about the like meaning polar versus nonpolar, but polar versus nonpolar is what ultimately gives us the intermolecular forces. Now, if you're going to really get into the gory details of, intermolec of uh, solubility, what we have to realize is what co what's the ultimate reason for something to become to be soluble or to, for two things to become miscible with each other and ultimately we would have to worry about the delta g of the system so we have to go all the way back to general chemistry and talk about 
the free energy change and whether that is spontaneous or not spontaneous. Okay, and remember delta G is equal to delta H, delta H minus T delta S. So we have to know about entropy and we have to know about the, I'm sorry, about enthalpy delta H and entropy delta S. Well, delta S is the disorder of the system. And in essence, the disorder, when you're making a solution out of two pure liquids or two pure substances, the disorder goes up, right, automatically. So the disorder increasing is going to be a positive term, so the question becomes the delta H. And it also ultimately becomes the T in the temperature as to whether or not these become, this will or will not become, um, will or will not become a spontaneous system. So I'm going to disregard the delta G here, and I'm just going to talk about sort of the delta H idea here as to whether or not two things will um, dissolve in each other because this term, this disorder term, can be hopefully made big enough to overcome this delta H term even if it was an endothermic process. We could apply a high enough temperature range to get the system spontaneous. So think about a couple of steps here. The first thing I'm going to do to make my solution is I'm going to take my solvent molecules and I'm going to break them apart so they're isolated. What's that going to take? Enough energy to overcome these types of intermolecular forces, whatever they are for the solvent. I'm going to take my solute and I'm going to have to break it apart into individual non-attracted molecules in order to make bring these non-attracted molecules and these non-attracted molecules together to form my solution where there's attraction between the two different molecules. So it's going to cost me energy, right? It's going to cost me energy to break the molecules apart to begin with. So if I'm looking at this as a delta H process, this is going to be endothermic and this is going to be endothermic. But when I bring these two molecules together, and they become attracted to each other, what's going to happen? That's going to be an exothermic process. So if I'm looking at this in just a very simple ma manner, the question is, am I going to get enough energy out of forming intermolecular forces between molecules A and B that it cost me to break A apart and to break B apart. And if that, those two energies are about equal, even if I don't get enough out, I, maybe I can raise the temperature enough to make the system become spontaneous. But if, there, if I don't get enough energy out of here, out of the bringing the two species together, then I'm not going to be able to pay for breaking them apart. And those two materials will not be soluble in each other. And so in that case, they won't dissolve. Okay, that's how we have to look at this if you really want to get into the gory details of looking at the energies. So this involves intermolecular forces. What kind of intermolecular forces do the solvents undergo? What type of intermolecular forces do the solutes undergo with themselves? And then what kind of intermolecular forces will they undergo if they come together? So when we look at taking an ionic substance and dissolving it in water, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to break the positive and negative ions apart. That's going to take an incredible amount of energy because these are full-blown positive charge and negative charges. They got incredible coulombic attraction. And remember, an ionic substance doesn't just have a two-dimensional arrangement. In the back here, there's a three-dimensional structure, so every ion is surrounded by like six different other ions. So it's going to take an incredible amount of energy. But what kind of energy am I going to get out? Well, I'm going to get a lot of ion dipole forces by solvating the ion with the polar water molecule. And so the idea here is that this energy that I'm going to get out here, 
is going to pay for breaking the ions apart and then also breaking the water molecules apart in terms of their hydrogen bonds. Now, some ionic solids like calcium chloride, which is the little white pellets that you sometimes put on your driveway in the middle of winter, if you drop calcium chloride pellets in water, the reaction is overall exothermic so that if you did that in a styrofoam cup, it would melt the styrofoam cup. Some solids like ammonium chloride, this process is endothermic, and so if you mixed ammonium chloride solid with water, you would actually feel this as the solution occurs, you would actually feel the solution get cold because it's taking energy from the surroundings in order to make that system spontaneous. That's what is used in cold packs. So in this case, the ion dipole force just about makes up or sometimes makes up more than enough for busting the ions apart and also busting the water molecules apart. But what happens if I try and take a nonpolar solvent and dissolve an ionic substance in it? It won't go. It takes a very little energy to break the nonpolar molecules apart, right? They're just dispersion forces. But then the fo but the force it's going to take to break the ions apart and the force, the intermolecular force between an ion and an induced dipole is not going to make up for the energy that it's going to take to break the ions apart. So there's no way an ionic substance will dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. Not because it's not easy to break the, the nonpolar ions apart or nonpolar molecules apart. That's easy. But I just don't get enough energy to break this apart. Oil and water, right? Classic like doesn't dissolve unlike. I take my my typical oil that has carbons and hydrogens, and later on we'll learn that this is essentially a nonpolar material. We take our nonpolar molecules and we try and dissolve them into a nonpolar solvent. Will they go? Absolutely. Why? Well, because it doesn't take much energy to break nonpolar solids apart. It doesn't take much energy to pull nonpolar solvents apart. Do I get a, a lot of energy in terms of forming the dispersion force between the nonpolar solute and the nonpolar solvent? No, I don't get a lot of energy, but it didn't take a lot of energy to break the solute and the solvent apart. So in this case, I've just about broken even, so like dissolves like. But try that with water and what happens. Your nonpolar sol solid doesn't dissolve in water. Oil doesn't dissolve in water. Why not? Didn't take much energy to break the nonpolar solids apart, right? Takes an incredible amount of energy to break the waters apart, particularly if I'm only going to get a non -di or a, uh, dispersion dipole force out at the end not enough energy in there to break the water molecules apart. So it's not a question of breaking these guys apart. That's easy. I can't break the water molecules apart in order to have them solvate that nonpolar solid. And so we use intermolecular forces in essence to figure out how much energy it's going to take to break the solutes apart, to break the solvent apart, and then see how much we get back when we form the solute-solvent intermolecular force. And again, if you just about break even, then you can probably get the material to dissolve. If you don't, it won't. And so we have all sorts of different types of non-polar molecules. Here's one. These are long-chained, what are called carboxylic acids. I've got lots of carbons and hydrogens on this tail. And then I've got a C double bond OH group, which is a polar group. This is what would be used to make, in biology, a fatty acid. Here's the fat part, the nonpolar part. We take a nonpolar part and we attach it to a polar group. And what do I get? I get a molecule that's got a polar group and a nonpolar group. You may say, so what? Well, here's so what. If we take that polar group, and in particular with a carboxylic acid, if I deprotonate it so it becomes a fully negative end, 
Then I can make things like surfactants, which is just a fancy name for a soap or a detergent. I got a long hydrophobic end, right? The hydrophobic is the nonpolar end. I've got a hydrophilic end, water-loving polar end. And so sometimes I can make the hydrophobic ends all be attracted together, or actually they can't break the water molecules apart, and the hydrophilic end can break the water molecules apart, so I get a nonpolar surface on top of a polar surface. When we wax our cars, that's in essence what, what we do, is put a nonpolar material over a polar material. The long chain carboxylic acids, when we put them together, we make triglycerides from biology. What are triglycerides? Well, they're either fats or oils. It's a fat if it's a solid, and it's an oil if it's a liquid. It doesn't get any easier than that. We got our non-polar groups here. And then we have this sort of a polar group here that kind of holds this together. Here's what that would look like with all the gray, the white and the gray being the nonpolar part of the triglyceride. And so what do we do if, when we take that triglyceride and we treat it with sodium hydroxide? We break the fat or the oil up and we make this polar head group. And now what we've done is we've made a detergent or a soap. So if you want to make soap, get some fat or some oil, you know, go go get some lard, which is pig fat, or get some coconut oil, which is coconut oil, and or, you know, uh, what else can you, olive oil, anything like that. Treat it with lye, and you will make a molecule that's got a nonpolar group and a polar group, and what happens? The nonpolar group doesn't dissolve in water, the polar group does. And so when we mix that soap with a fiber that's got some nonpolar grease or oil on it, the nonpolar groups of the uh, surfactant or, in the, or the soap or the detergent, they become attracted to each other. The head groups dissolve in water. And so what happens? Eventually we get a globule of oil or grease that's surrounded by polar groups that basically solubilize the oil droplet in water and that's how we use soap to clean up oil and grease and general dirt. So we combine a polar and a non-polar parts of the molecule together to give us something that has the ability to part of it to dissolve in water, part of it to dissolve non-polar substances. Okay, and that's basically how our soaps and our detergents work. So there's a little practical organic and general chemistry. So the idea here is that this lecture was sort of the, the final part of general chemistry. What do we do once we get a Lewis dot structure of Vesper theory? We move to polarity intermolecular forces. And then here's your examples of how we can use the intermolecular forces to do some interesting things. And we'll talk about actually soaps later on towards the end of the year when we talk about um, the different functional groups. Okay? So that's um, the last of the reviews. In class, what we will do is we'll talk, we'll, I'll give you some Lewis dot structures. Can you tell me whether those molecules are polar or nonpolar? If I give you two molecules, with, can you write the Lewis dot structures and then tell me what's the strongest intermolecular force that those two molecules can undergo? And so you're going to have to do Lewis dot structure, you're going to have to do Vesper theory, you're going to have to determine whether it's polar or nonpolar, and then figure out what it's in. So we will do that on Friday.